Is the Congress Rahul? Is Rahul the Congress? This is a very interesting conversation to actually have. Uh, how much of the Congress, for example, agrees with what Rahul is saying? Those are very, very, I think, intriguing questions. I don't think that Modi can survive one day of walking on the road and listening to people. There is so much disgruntlement. Doesn't matter where, whether you go to a remote village in Chhattisgarh, whether you go to Tamil Nadu, whether you go to Delhi, whether you go to Kashmir. When you have a yatra like this, in which you know somebody who gets troll, like let's say Swara Baskar is walking, or someone like Krishna is walking, it kind of tells you that not only is Krishna with Rahul, but Rahul Gandhi is with him. Krishna, Rahul Gandhi is with is with people who are challenging power. I mean, I think there's enough history to tell us that the conversations on hate and anger travel much faster than conversations that are about compassion and social justice and uh, difficult, complex feelings. What Rahul's yatra is doing is, it's, in many ways, it's sometimes a mirror to society, isn't it? Like, you know, people start questioning, does a leader have to be aggressive? Does a leader have to be a very good orator? Or does he have to be a listener? Obsession with machismo uh, that we have as far as political leaders or how they have to speak, how they have to behave, the, 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 the voice, the tone of their voice, it's high time that is broken. The Bharat Jodo Yatra started on the 7th of September. It's an ambitious project by the Congress and Rahul Gandhi in particular to traverse 3,500 kilometers across the length and breadth of the country. It's completed almost 105, 106 days around 500 kilometers left. There are many people who have joined Rahul Gandhi in this yatra. Many of them don't belong to the Congress. They are not politicians either. Joining me are two such people, artists, uh, activists, authors. Uh, there are many categories in which you could uh, box uh, or rather not box either of them. Meena Kandaswamy and TM Krishna. So straight to the, um, the, the main question, why did you decide to go for the Bharat Jodo Yatra, Meena? Uh, thank you for having me at uh, your interview, Danya. Thank you so much. At some point, there's also like, uh, you know this very well as a journalist, uh, there's this give moment when you know that you're not going to sit and you know debate about something sitting in your in your desk. You have to go there and see for yourself. So you know, like there's a lot of there's a lot of a lot of people who are welcoming it, but there's also the idea that you know, is it just for eyeballs? Is it just an image makeover for Rahul Gandhi? Uh, and uh, what does it mean to actually go to the people? Like it's literally going to the people. So there's all of these questions that were thrown. And I was like, you know, the best way to make up your mind or to have an impression is to go there in person and to see for oneself. Uh, and so that's why that's why I went to Kanyakumari uh, for the first uh, one or two days of the Yatra. Team Krishna. Uh, thanks, Danya, for having us in this conversation. I think the most uh, striking thing for me, you know, keeping aside the Congress or even Rahul Gandhi, is the texture of the conversation that the Yatra initiated right from the beginning. One, it invited civil society members saying, just come with us in this idea of bringing people together. I think in today's environment where politics is filled with uh, a messaging that is meant to divide you or to hate somebody or to dislike somebody. Um, I thought that this, this was a refreshing start in terms of even the texture of saying, let's come together. Now, coming together itself does not mean we agree about everything. I think mm. that's an important aspect that you don't need to be part of the Congress. You don't need to agree with everything that the Congress stands for. But can we come together with this feeling of saying there is a necessity for, for harmony? There's a necessity for compassion. And to me, that was uh, indeed striking. And um, I didn't join them in Tamil Nadu. Uh, but I joined them in Madhya Pradesh just about the beginning of uh, December. And uh, I think one following the Yatra on you know, social media, etc. is very different from also joining it and participating and seeing on ground what is happening. And that was the reason I, I really felt I need to go there and see what was going on, irrespective of you know, differences that may be there and reasons why we also agree with many things. Yeah. So what were your first, uh, what were your thoughts as you were a part of the Yatra? Uh, and not just of the Yatra, but of Rahul Gandhi himself, the way he's interacting with people. Uh, what did you think about the Yatra itself, Meena? I, I know that you went on the first day, but you have been observing the Yatra all these days. Um, so 
So I have a very interesting relationship with the Congress, uh, especially as somebody coming from Tamil Nadu. Uh, you know, at various points, the Congress uh, represents various different things. So, you know, at some point it represents the independent struggle. At some point it represents the interests of the landed bourgeoisie. Uh, at some point it represents uh, factionalist interests. Some points it uh, represents um, a very um, the opposition to Tamil nationalism or support for Elam uh, because of a very difficult history there. Uh, sometimes it represents the imposition of Hindi. So I think it's um, it's it's you know the Congress is a mixed bag, and when you're a Tamil, uh, especially post two thousand nine, your opinions on the Congress is really very. It's a lot of uh, contro. It's, it should be controversial. It should be like, what's Congress doing? You know. At the same time, uh, we are in a political climate where we know that uh, we all say we believe in democracy, and if we really believe in democracy, we have to believe in a strong opposition. And you know, Congress is vital to whatever opposition exists in the country. So, for all of this host of reasons, uh, you know. Uh, the Congress is an inevitable force. I'm not sure whether they are realizing it yet, at least in the entire enormous nature of, you know, what the Congress necessarily means at this moment. So it was important to go there. But I think, and the reason I said all of these things about the Congress, so why it was has a difficult relationship for Tamil people, is that at some point Rahul Gandhi comes to Tamil Nadu and says, I am Tamil, you know. Uh, I am somebody who has... You know, my blood is mixed with your soil. And I think it was a very emotional message. Uh, and not just, you know, uh, not just as a Tamil, but also as an, as an onlooker or somebody who looks at what it does to politics. And then I thought that this is a very interesting uh, thing that's unfolding in front of us, you know, uh, because there's so many ways in which it could have turned. Uh, because, you know, even for me, um, Rajiv Gandhi's assassination was the first time I encountered death, like an actual death like an actual somebody gone. And so you know that, you know, you could, it could turn you in any way. But the fact that he, he chose to forgive, he chose to embrace people, he chose to understand Tamil people, he chose to use this very tragic point as an entry into, into understanding this culture, into understanding this politics, into, you know, kind of a perception shift. And I thought like, if Rahul is going, is so willing after such personal loss to come all this way, then we what about us? Like, shouldn't we be willing to go and see what he has to offer? Shouldn't we be also, you know, open open ourselves up for this perception shift? So it was very interesting to go there. Uh, this was not my first um, interaction with Rahul. Uh, in fact, the t this time uh, I sat in on like three of the meetings. I walked a little bit with him. I walked, uh, I walked to rather run with the crowd. Then I was part of, you know, this uh, video graphing team. All of this happened, but the main thing was this time I didn't even go and say hi, I and mean, then I Sami because uh, I wanted to be behind the scenes. It was not important for me to to make an impression on Rahul, but rather just to absorb everything, you know, just being a wallpaper or something. Uh, but I've had the chance to meet him and talk to him at length because Jignesh and I once met him in Delhi. So uh, my impressions of him are, you know, something that forms over a longer period of time and impressions that are formed from observing him react with others as opposed to observing how a politician reacts with you because uh, as someone, someone who has observed politicians for a long time, they can be absolute charmers, you know, so it's better to look at them from a distance, I think, so yeah. Uh, Mr. Krishna, I was reading your article in which you said that there, there are questions before going for a yatra, right? But once you go for the yatra, are you going to be identified with the Congress? Would that mean that people would think you have a particular per ideology? Uh, how did that, how much that bother you? And why did you finally take the call that no, no matter what people think, I will go for the Yatra? I mean, yeah, I mean, those, those questions do arise, especially when you know that a Yatra like this is headed by a political party and by Rahul himself. Uh, the question is, what kind of association do you want with it? Do you agree with, with, the, with the messaging, but do you want to be part of it? I think these were conversations that not just me, I mean, many of us actually had these conversations. Uh, but I think, the, like I said before, the reason why I felt at least strongly that we need to participate and right from word go, I couldn't go to Kanyakumari, unfortunately, because I was traveling, um, is that I just felt that there is a desperate need to engage in a conversation that is not matlabi, as they say in, in Hindi, you know, not just matlabi, that the conversation is something more about 
the kind of politics we want in our society, the kind of contestations that we want in our society. And I felt that this yatra was allowing that to flow, that allowing that to happen. And that is, uh, that is indeed rare. And to your question on how it was, I joined the yatra in Madhya Pradesh, like I said. So entirely different uh, environment, entirely different, you know, solid Hindi bell. Uh, I was in Agar, which is a district closer to Rajasthan, and they were, they were going into Rajasthan the next day. And to me, what was very evident, um, not just um, conversation with Rahul kept aside, is that for the people who came, not just the Congress uh, party members, this meant a certain positivity, a certain change in fear, or at least a subsiding of fear. And, and I you know there was this village where these people came and said when the Yatra passed, things were better, even temporarily, that you felt more confident. These were uh, villages with, with a lot of uh, you know, Muslims. That I think is, is, is the next conversation to have. But the fact that he's accessible, and I think there's also a, a, an important textual shift here, which is important. Now, is the Congress Rahul and is Rahul the Congress? This is a very interesting conversation to actually have. Uh, how much of the Congress, for example, agrees with what Rahul is saying? Those are very, very, I think, intriguing questions. And I think they're important questions. Because I'm not sure, for example, the Rahul, I mean, the Congress really understands the nuances of the Yatra, right? And what kind of communication is happening there? But they are all participating, of course. The old uh, guard, as I said in my article also, there's the old guard and there's the new guard. They're all participating. But also the fact that Rahul has been able to, in a way, detach himself from that position of being a Congress person vis-a-vis also being an individual, I think is also an important shift through this yatra. That people are seeing the individual. Whether they agree with the individual or not, they are seeing the individual. And I think these are small nuanced shifts that are possible because he has allowed himself to have these conversations. It's not just about being accessible. I mean, that I think is a very superficial way of looking at it. But even the messaging, if you look at what he says through the 100 days that they have traveled, I think that's also important. That, that the nature of what he is saying, even the combative statements he's making. Meena, do you think at the end of this Yatra, I mean, the Yatra is almost in the last leg. Would the Congress gain something? Would Rahul Gandhi gain or would both gain? Uh, I think actually to begin the question, um, uh, I, I want to take on Krishna's point actually. I think people are gaining. Uh, as he said, you know, the shifting temperature and uh, and it's it's really a very deep and perceptive statement because I remember when I came back from, you know, visiting UDP and all of these hijab things had gone gone around and, you know, students were not allowed to wear and they were kept out and there was this, you know, threat of violence and, um, and you know, I was talking to Jignesh and to other, you know, couple of Congress leaders uh, whom I may not want to name. And the idea was that, you know, at some point they have to take a peace march to say that they are with the people, they are with the girls, they are with, you know, um, they, they stand for peace and harmony. And at the time, like, you know, even if it's a very specific issue to a very specific place, uh, they had clamped down Section 144. Uh, you know, they had given curfew orders. So, you know, even the Congress, if it wanted to hold a peace march, could not hold a peace march. And I am trying to link that to what is happening here because... Sometimes if there is a curfew in place in one place doesn't mean that, you know, we all have to be silent. Like, you know, Rahul marching with, let's say, a young hijabi girl comes and gets photographed with him and he's marching in the streets. I think that sends a message. That sends a message everywhere, including to the oppressive, you know, or, you know, difficult communal places like uh, what's happening in Udupi. So I really think that that is important in the sense like, you know, the, the, the wider reach. And, you, and I think it's changing a lot of the nature of the fabric of society. Sometimes I would like to think even from the controversy that comes, like, you know, Rahul is like seen holding a woman's hand. Rahul is seen hugging a, a, a woman politician or, a, you know, a young woman or a older woman or, you know. And then the, the way in which it's churning our society, the way in which there's so, so many people taking offense about it, going critical about it, character assassinating uh, I really think it's a question that, you know, actually addresses the question of what is it to be a woman in politics? What is it to be seen in the public sphere? What is, what is it to be a man in politics? So I think that in that sense, you know, all of these, the way these spaces are opened up, the way it allows us to reimagine what it is to be a mass leader and what it is to be a mass leader who can be approached by women without, you know, necessarily having to have his name tarnished. 
I think these are really larger questions. So I I'm, I I want to open up on that. So both, uh, in a sense, it's a uh, it's a kind of you know national. Uh, churning as well because you know we are we are and every day the the only social media that you really get in, in a large quantity is the hate and the hate sends a kind of message because there are still right thinking people who are going to revisit these things and you know uh, introspect or reflect on them so for instance he was meeting a lot of activists and you know we all know that yogendra yadav has been on the ground he's been involved with you know mobilizing local activists getting them to have like this really personal really direct uh, audience with rahul and where i've seen everyone like initially question him on the stand of the congress but also tell rahul about the urgency of many things for instance uh, the caste census uh, reservation in the private sector uh, the issue and many of the people were talking about the environment all the ecological fallout so many of these projects that are going on uh, in the name of development you know um, rapacious a vicious capitalism that you know is represented by a few interests so all of these people are asking very hard hitting questions to him and at the same time you realize that next to rahul are people who actually champion some of these environmental disasters some people who champion some of these you know very backward looking things like let's say nuclear energy or whatever it is whatever you may wish to call it and then you're like how are we going to balance these two but i think that you know one of those things about this yatra is that um if the people are willing to uh you know i i think that even the congress is going to have to ask hard questions to itself uh but you know i wrote up after the yatra uh, for the while and one of those things that i wanted to say is if you want to change the the persons who are in power then uh the society in a way has to be changed you know we test because unless our society's mindset on many things change we are going to elect the same people to power again and again so in that sense this yatra is a way in which some social change or at least social perceptive change or you know opinions change public influence public discourse might you know cause a little bit of churning we also have to say that for once the only news that you do, read about congress is not just about you know congress uh, mlas being bought by the bjp or congress dissolving into further factions a congress becoming new regional party so for once congress is in the news for good reasons you know hmm. so yeah so no, that's actually one of my observations that whatever said and done one good thing that the yatra has done is get congress some coverage especially in the local media like whichever state he traverses through rahul gandhi is getting a lot of coverage in the in that st- particular state's media which the congress hardly ever gets these days see one one thing that i notice whenever i read any analysis any coverage everything everybody unanimously says including yogendra yadav that i don't know whether this will translate into votes i don't know how this will help the congress but at the end of the day sadly i mean whatever perception changes society changes etc etc it all boils down to electoral politics and who people vote for right so do you think this yatra can make a difference that way uh, mr krishna so the first is question is when like do you want it to uh, make a difference in 2024 is this conversation directed towards uh, 24 elections i mean we have to ask ourselves that um see for there are two three things one for this to convert itself now we're talking about the congress and not necessarily uh, the larger political question uh for this to translate to something in the congress it the congress needs desperate change in its structural basis in first of all it's not a cadre party it's a party that does not have cadre at all to be very blunt in many places so they may pass through and create a euphoria for some time but do they have anybody there in those districts to continue that conversation the next month and that's a conversation i had with many people i said what's going to happen next week okay for two days you pass through this place but many places they don't have the way with all to do it there is there there is a very hierarchical kind of a party where uh, <laughs> the congress workers really do not have agency is the congress willing to change that texture will there be agency for the congress workers now these are issues that they have to deal with secondly even in places where they are in power say for example rajasthan elections are round the block right but what is happening there there are i mean what is how much do the people know for example how much gelos government has actually done for them there is a vacuum of information if you ask them the people don't know there are some great plans they put into place they have actually functionalized it it's working but that there's no communication so there's a great communication back, gap you know forgetting about the larger congress structure from delhi 
even at local state levels congress has major issues that it needs to address i'm not even coming to south india because that's a that's actually a politically non existent conversation as far as tamil nadu etc is concerned does the yatra mean that the the vote transfer we are talking about a vote transfer now need to happen only to the congress no that's also an interesting thing to think about it is distinctly possible that the yatra can result in a vote transfer to some other party too if it can empower people in that location where there are partner parties or where the congress is not powerful but there's another party that's powerful is it possible that this yatra can do something for that i think that's an interesting thing to also explore and not make a one to one correlation necessarily between the yatra and the congress benefiting so whether 2024 you will see you know uh, markers or or you know shall say results from the yatra i am not able to definitely say until we see what happens in february march april june july of 2023 going up to 24 but i think there's another point and yogendra and i had this conversation about it even before the yatra is what are we as civil society members doing i think that's an, that's also an important question irrespective of what the congress is going to do irrespective of what rahul gandhi is going to do how are we going to shall we say participate in similar messaging in our own way as collectives i think that's also something we should think about you yeah, know um, see the pictures the videos that emerge out of bharat jodo yatra is mainly of rahul gandhi the very friendly person rahul gandhi the approachable affable politician right the other day i was listening to mahua moitra speech in the parliament where she says who's the pappu now and then she goes on this very long speech asking who's the pappu to the government Rahul Gandhi is the one branded Pappu by the BJP, and he's never actually aggressively taken on even that messaging. It took a Mahua Moitra to actually spell that word out in the parliament. So, does this messaging of this friendly, affable Rahul Gandhi help, or do you think he needs to get more aggressive while countering a party like the BJP? I really think that masculinity is overrated, and uh, this is something I also said earlier that you know what Rahul's yatra is doing is it's. in many ways it sometimes a mirror to society isn't it like you know people start questioning does a leader have to be aggressive does a leader have to be a very good orator or does he have to be a listener is he just going to do all of his you know big speaking on the stage or is he somebody who's going to listen to people uh, and everybody agrees but um, but i also think that you know he comes from a certain uh, dynasty if you may use the word or legacy if you want to be more polite <coughs> and i don't think for a second the people would believe um that anybody from the uh, gandhi family don't have a people connect i think that the the opinion is actually on the other side like you know uh, and, and and i saw this uh, with my own eyes that uh, rahul um, and i was really scared for him because he doesn't really seem to respect security like if people are there he just runs and goes and you know shakes his hand or and people you know his security are sometimes like really you see the fear on their faces like he he's breaching these lines so he's going ahead and then they have to encircle him again and they have to provide cover for him so he's really always had a people's connect um and this is just you know very good uh, very clever propaganda so i don't think that uh, you know nobody exists in order to at least i don't know if i was a politician i don't think my primary job would be uh, just countering propaganda you know like uh there's so much that rahul has to offer you know in terms of his perspective on um you know social justice or you know the, a lot of you know the question of women or women politics whatever it is that you talk about um so i don't think that you know he should he should spend his time saying i'm not a papu because sometimes you know <laughs> when you no, you no, is there a dichotomy there what rahul has to offer what you know rahul's thoughts about social justice or Ra- how rahul perceives women but the party remains to be very different in many different in many ways right so uh, how do we, how do we start viewing things are we going to look at rahul gandhi separately from the congress no no uh, just to go back to this papu thing uh, the thing is for instance St- stalin is somebody who has been constantly trolled and now he's proving himself in office because you know people decide to give him a chance and you know uh, see what he has to offer because of what the party stands for and obviously stalin uh, stalin was not coming and saying oh i'm not all these things you call me you know uh, he was not i think the dmk ran a very successful campaign in tamil nadu and none of the campaign was to tell people uh, that you know the uh, opposition prop- they were not addressing the stalin's image directly i don't think that congress or rahul should go and say 
I'm not Papu. Well, if Mahua wants to choose to say that, uh, it's her prerogative, you know. Uh, and um, because I think all all kinds of leaders, uh, the BJP especially, really is is bringing politics down to a very gutter level. So sometimes the question is, do you want to go down to that level? And it's not just for Congress; it's for everyone, you know. Uh, I was reading the article in which you also said, Mr. Krishna, that. to you know people who want are waking out of their moral stupor should join the bharat jodo yatra was <coughs> that this is an exaggeration no i don't think so uh, i mean uh, it is a direct statement to meant what exactly it's not exa- exaggeration and you know i think the moral stupor is a very interesting thing why I people can do been... other stuff waking out of moral stupor no, why join the bharat jodo yatra I agree. I agree. But I am talking directly in terms of taking political action, and I agree with you. I'm, I'm not saying that this is the only way you can participate. But the reason I said that is that <coughs> many people who are, shall we say, who don't want to participate, let's put it that way, um, are not participating for for reasons that don't make sense for me in this present climate. To me, that if To be, to, when you've woken up from moral stupor, when you're doing your own thing, you're, I don't find a reason why you should, you cannot participate if you can. Logistics kept aside, if you can, not for reasons like saying, you know, for example, I mean, Meena pointed to the fact that he belongs to a dynasty. Now you can keep talking, talking about that, but we also need to talk about what is the texture of the conversation that this individual is bringing. What is the yatra doing? You can still disagree with the dynastic rule. You can still have an argument with him. In which case, you'll have to go to all political parties. By the way, the Congress is not exclusive in terms of dynastic politics. We know that. And then we'll have to look at our cultural problem, our feudal mindset, our casteist mindset, within which this kind of dynasty is operating in every sphere of politics or social life. I don't think uh, waiting for the right party or the right individual or an individual who ticks all the ethical boxes or progressive boxes that we may build works. The question is. is the individual willing to have a conversation most important listening and willing to learn we need politicians who are willing to learn and i think rahul definitely shows that he is willing to listen he is willing to learn and he wants to learn and i think that's far more important than i'd like to second what meena said about this obsession with machismo uh, that we have as far as political leaders or how they have to speak how they have to behave the, the 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 voice the tone at their voice it's high time that is broken and one last point if you don't mind about whether this will have political uh, gain please remember that in the united states of america biden did win, win the election and trump was pushed out but the the politics in america has not changed the hate is still filled i think that whether or not 24 happens this bharat jodo yatra if it is carried on in different ways we can not only change the way politicians are elected but also change the texture of politics and i think we have to think long term about the next generation about the next 20 20 years of what kind of younger generation what kind of politics are we building so i think there is a larger vision that can be built from the bharat jodo yatra Do you seem Rahul to agree that uh, uh, Rahul Gandhi is a leader who listens, who perhaps wishes to learn? But one issue here is that a lot of people in India are perhaps not looking for textured conversations in politics. It all boils down to who is their leader. And for example, if you uh, put up uh, Narendra Modi against Rahul Gandhi, there is still a huge population which says, "But there is a Tina factor. There is no alternative to uh, what Narendra Modi represents." What do you have to say to a lot of people who think that way, Amina? uh see the thing is uh you have you have to realize that the bjp came to power on a yatra it was advani's infamous rath yatra the yatra of hate the yatra that you know uh came at a very precise moment in indian history when uh finally the majority of this country the bahujan people you know the uh, uh who had been kept out of <coughs> a lot of uh, state welfare um and social justice finally got access to it the minute the mandal commission happens and the minute there is an idea that uh, the caste system would be in its own way compromised and shattered uh, they try to deflect the politics by starting advani's very infamous rath yatra and we know how it ended uh, 
uh, it ended you know in a sense with the demolition of the babri masjid but it also ended with you know the introduction of uh, extreme communalization of the politics uh, othering the muslim it ended with a, you know a lot of you know that's where we are today so you know i wouldn't just look at it as modi's uh, uh, ascent to power was on the yatra on the other hand what is happening now is the opposite it's a yatra of you know unity it's a yatra of social justice it's a yatra that um, addresses the people so uh, why don't we you know this yatra it takes place in the 90s and today in 2014 or 19 after 20 years they are able to you know capture power together so you know it's going to take maybe uh, a generation maybe it's going to take 10 years maybe it's going to take 20 years but this is the this is the beginning of the reimagination of india as a nation not as a nation that's divided but as a nation that's united so, so uh, it's uh, impossible to not look as, to forget that message and uh, that's where i want to address the first uh, aspect of your question the second thing is is there no alternative to modi my only idea is that if modi was not doing just a road show of waving to people like do you i do you i as an indian citizen as somebody who follows the news as a writer i don't think that modi can survive one day of walking on the road and listening to people there is so much disgruntlement doesn't matter where whether you go to a remote village in chatisgarh whether you go to tamil nadu whether you go to delhi whether you go to kashmir i'm sure the people have very choice things to say to mr modi can he listen he runs away from media he runs away from everybody do you think you know media people people like you journalists are so sophisticated you're so polite like but people are not going to talk in the same with the same politeness do you think he's willing to face people like Rah- rahul is the exact opposite of modi it's not just about accessibility you know when we say accessibility we are talking about you know downloading a software or you know some accessibility is also about taking criticism is about facing facing the consequences of your actions it's about it's about you know this continuous introspection that happens when you are having to answer difficult questions but you know we have a prime minister who has not given a single interview and here you have someone actually facing not only journalists but actual people with grievances people with you know petitions people with memorandums people with issues so i think this is rahul is the alternative i i don't uh, i don't want to mince my words saying that so my question to both is you have both been part of the bharat jodo yatra meena was saying that perhaps she may even go again to be uh, to walk yeah. along with the yatra one more time uh, i've read whatever you both have written after being a part of the yatra do you seriously believe that congress is the alternative uh, meena's article especially i felt that she does not believe in the concept of a third front do you strongly believe mm-hmm. that the congress has to somehow emerge from all this and become the other the alternative uh i think you forgot to ask the most important question uh, which is that uh, when is tm krishna joining the congress or when is because that's what people always say you know you, you you go and start walking and everybody all your friends are like when are you joining the congress you know, but so i asked at the beginning itself that uh, the fact that you had so many doubts whether you should go for the yatra you're going to be branded congress uh, hey. i asked him himself but it wouldn't be a surprise no. right if all the people are congress now Mm-hmm. yeah so <laughs> so yeah we completely smitten but anyway uh, coming to this uh, the idea no the thing is i think at some points congress has to eat humble pie and realize that maybe they are not uh, they have to cobble up in a, a third front um, uh, but not a third front they have to cobble up an alternative front uh, and uh, you know respect the regional parties but in many ways these regional parties are not very different from congress some of them are faction you know factions or breakaways from the congress itself but in, in but the problem is here we have a first past the post system we have a democracy that you know uh, even if let's say 60% did not vote for a particular party they still holding power it's still a democracy where you know you cannot have a single muslim mp and be ruling the country like all of this is like that's 20% of the pop- 15% of the population where are they like uh, in your ranks so the question is then that uh, how is the congress going to handle that field like you know uh, and i think it's a question they have to ask themselves but uh, a third front would only like we saw in gujarat what happened and this is not just you know like oh meena sharing for the congress and this is a question i i think for india like how does how is india going to have a non bjp government at some point and the thing is that um, if you are in a non congress front then your bjp is team b <laughs> sometimes you can also be bjp team c so i i don't think uh, that's the answer so, do you also think so that a third front or someone who stands uh, as separate from the congress and the bjp becomes team b or team c of the bjp or 
Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that when there are, uh, in today's environment with BJP's inroads that it's made uh, across uh, societies, um, a three-way fight in any way uh, helps the Congress or the third party that may be fighting. There's no doubt about it. Just the math once again, again, again tells you that if the two parties had gotten together, the numbers would have been very different. The fight would have been very different. So I think this is a no-brainer. Um, now, this... You know, also this whole thing, you know, people, I don't want to associate with the BJP or the Congress. Now, this has been like thrown around very often. What that really means, nobody will tell you. You know, it's one of those statements that seem convenient because you're looking at two large national parties. But actually, it is quite a silly statement to make because in many ways, many of these parties, leaving out their party mechanics out, actually can partner with the Congress. Actually can. No, I believe very strongly in regional parties. I believe India needs powerful, strong regional parties. That's irrespective of which national party has the numbers. I'm saying this outright. We need strong DMK. We need strong left in, 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 in Kerala. We need the JDU powerful because that only enriches the parliament for one, enriches the conversations and puts checks and balances that are there. If that means a decision takes one more day, I think we can still sit it out. But that cannot happen without a combination of these parties with the Congress. This is a reality of today. And therefore, and the Congress must realize it cannot survive if it is not willing to partner with humility, partner with a reality check, depending on which part of the country you're partnering in, with these parties. Like for in Tamil Nadu, they know very clearly what works for them. Okay, this is, a, this is a clear case where they know that without the DMK, they are pretty much non-existent in numbers. Now, but this needs to be understood, especially in the Hindi belt. Let's look at the numbers of the parliamentary election. The numbers are coming out of Uttar Pradesh, coming out of Madhya Pradesh, coming out of Rajasthan, coming out of uh, Gujarat, these areas. The Congress must realize this in these spaces. So my last question to both of you, Meena, I'll come to you first. Um, what do you, how do you think Bharat Jodo Yatra will change the political conversation in the country, if you think it will change? And as an artist, an activist, a writer, what do you see for India in the future? What do you want to see India as in the future? Uh, well, uh, I'm going to answer your question just very briefly. Before that, I, I was like, yeah, I'm misled about Krishna joining Congress. Krishna is joining DMK. That's my new name. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering, Nina, how you uh, said that because I'm not sure which party I'm supposed to join at this point. So, <laughs> so Nina has called me polite uh, indirectly in this interview because she said journalists like you, polite people. I'm yeah. very happy. <laughs> and she said that DM Krishna is joining the Congress, then she changed to DMK. Very controversial statements by Meena Kandri. Yeah, let's, let's wait and see. Let's wait and see. So, um, so the thing is, um, see, I, I think as writers, um, activists, journalists, whatever we call ourselves, all of us, uh, civil society, uh, the actual reason I first met Rahul was to talk about the Vima Koregao case. Uh, so Jignesh and I went and, you know, we spent a good hour with him. And it was very interesting because at some point, you know, we started talking about Rima Koregao, Pegasus, all of this, you know, the, you know, the way information had gone, how the writers were all framed. And then at some point, we were even discussing the reservation policy, how in Tamil Nadu we are giving it to various people. And, you know, Rahul was a politician who was willing to be contradicted, willing to have all of these arguments. You know, any other politician would have just said, fuck off. You know, they would have just shouted at you and, you know, they would be, who are you to lecture me? But uh, the experience I had with him then was like really, in that sense, humbling. Like, how could somebody in his stature give such patient listening? So coming to this, uh, uh, com so what is our role as writers is that, you know, there has been by picking out very specific people who are very influential, Asuda Bharatwaj, who was against a lot of corporations, mining, what's going on in Central India, picking out an Anand Teltrumte, who was raising very important questions about privatization, about education, uh, picking out a Varavara Rao. I think when very core individuals were picked out and imprisoned, I think it did make the rest of us silent. Partly because it took our energies into defending their freedoms, but partly because we understood, whether implicitly, explicitly, or subconsciously, that the price to pay is prison. And I think 
when you have a yatra like this in which you know somebody who gets trolled like let's say swarabaskar is walking or someone like krishna is walking it kind of tells you that not only is krishna with rahul but rahul gandhi is with and krishna rahul gandhi is with, is with people who are challenging power rahul gandhi extends his support so in that sense it's not only that you know we add something but he is also there as a moral support for us Uh, how do we initiate uh, national discourse how do we change public opinion i think people in civil society have the role and i think knowing that you still have some support knowing that you know you would not be left only to your own devices uh, knowing that you know there is at least one p- politician who understands what you're doing and that he has some numbers behind him i think that helps i think bharat jodo yatra definitely has has triggered a conversation which is very different from what we have heard so far there's i think there can be no doubt about it now whether it has the reach like the conversation of hate is of course up for questioning but always remember i mean i think there's enough history to tell us that the conversations on hate and anger travel much faster than conversations that are about compassion and social justice and uh, difficult complex feelings they always take a longer time <laughs> uh that's something we see the world over through history one uh but that this barajoda yatra has triggered this i think is definitely unquestionable i think what we need is a positively contested society uh, a society that is a society of contestations of society where we are willing to disagree we're willing to argue we're willing to have different uh, visions but not a society that's either going to throw you into the dustbin or treat you as nobody or tell you that you belong to some community or some gender or some sex and therefore you're lesser a society that allows for disagreements robustly and i think somehow we have whether we always at any point that is of course a, a larger historical question but i think that we can get there it we can go there in the next decade or two and i think there are enough examples of these things happening in clusters in small periods of time in different parts of the country but can that be part of what our nation building exercise is that the nation is not a mon- monolithic structure of one voice one nation one person one opinion one caste one religion one gender you know or perceptions of all these but a nation that is fundamentally in disagreement that i think is a beautiful state to be in and if it's a state of disagreement where multiple voices irrespective of their social address are heard then we are enriching our our environment and i think we may not get to the utopia of that thank you very much tm krishna and meena kandaswamy for joining me on this conversation on why you decided to join the bharat jodo yatra and you believe that this is going to change the texture of political conversation in the country but are people ready for that kind of change do people want to talk about different things only time will tell but as of now the bharat jodo yatra is definitely gaining a lot of eyeballs will it translate to electoral victory for the congress again a huge mystery thank you very much thank you